You may not be aware that the body's immune system decides which molecules to attack and which to accept. Immune tolerance therapies hope to teach our bodies to accept helpful molecules found in medications, in transplants, and those naturally found in our bodies. Unfortunately, immune tolerance is a topic poorly understood by medical professionals, and the definition of this term has been misrepresented. Here we will define immune tolerance using the latest information derived from clinical practice. First, you must understand the basic definitions of immune tolerance and immunity. Immune tolerance is when your body accepts and does not attack a specific molecule. However, the term antigen is used instead of the term molecule in the field of immunology. On the other hand, immunity is when your body attacks a specific molecule. Here we will focus on antibodies, which are attack molecules targeting a specific antigen. An antibody has a specificity for a single antigen. Antibodies are made by plasma cells and are distributed throughout the body. The term titer refers to the amount of antibody. For instance, a high titer of antibody means that you have a lot of that specific antibody. Antibodies have two important properties. The specificity of an antibody determines what the antibody binds to. For example, in the panel on the left, one antibody has a specificity for the wide portion of the antigen, while the other antibody has specificity for the narrow portion of the antigen. The class and subclass of an antibody determine the properties of the antibody. In the panel on the right, one antibody has a rectangular tail, while the other antibody has an oval tail. The antibody class can be IgM, IgG, IgA, IgM, or IgD. Subclasses provide further information. For instance, an antibody can be IgG1, IgG2, IgG3, or IgG4. The body achieves immune tolerance through a well-defined process. Immune tolerance can be achieved through central or peripheral tolerance. Central tolerance typically occurs early in human development, in the thymus and bone marrow while peripheral tolerance occurs throughout life in locations beyond the thymus and bone marrow. The basic process is that your body's immune cells, called lymphocytes, are removed if they react with molecules made by your own cells. For example, the lymphocyte on the left is able to attack the self-antigen presented by the cell. Therefore, this lymphocyte will die. On the right, the lymphocyte cannot attack the body's own antigens, and thus, this lymphocyte will live. The body uses this process to remove self-reactive immune cells. The process of immunity is simpler. Immunity, which involves the production of antibodies, occurs when an antigen is combined with a danger signal. For instance, bacteria have antigens and danger signals. The danger signal tells your body to create an antibody against the bacterial antigen. The body decides on tolerance and immunity for a specific antigen on a continuing basis. For a given antigen, tolerance and immunity can be depicted on a seesaw diagram. If an antigen is perceived in the absence of danger signals, then the body will be tolerant to the antigen. If an antigen is perceived in the presence of danger signals, then the body will develop immunity against the antigen. Importantly, throughout the human lifespan, the body can change its response to an antigen, from tolerance to immunity, or from immunity to tolerance. Modern medicine can manipulate these forces. Immunity can be taught to the body. Immunization is a process in which the body can be taught to produce an antibody against an antigen. For instance, the flu vaccine is a form of immunization against the flu virus. This can be achieved by injecting an antigen with a danger signal, also known as an adjuvant. Sometimes the entire microbe, instead of a single antigen from the microbe, is used. The adjuvant can be naturally part of the microbe itself, or non-organic adjuvants can be used, such as aluminum. Likewise, tolerance can be taught to the body. By providing antigen without danger signals, the body can be forced to stop producing antigen-specific antibodies. However, achieving tolerance is more difficult than achieving immunity. Now that you have seen the basics of immunity and tolerance, you can learn about real-world immune tolerance induction. In 2017, the most advanced immune tolerance induction therapy is for the medication Coagulation Factor 8, 
which is needed by hemophilia A patients. To understand this tolerance induction process, you must first understand hemophilia A. Hemophilia A patients lack functional factor VIII, so they need factor VIII medication. However, when factor VIII is given to hemophilia A patients, a significant percentage will make antibodies against the drug. The antibodies prevent the drug from working. The antibodies against factor VIII come in two varieties. Those that prevent the drug from working are called neutralizing antibodies, or simply inhibitors. Those which do not prevent the drug from working are called non-neutralizing antibodies. These antibodies differ in specificity, which is where they bind to factor VIII. Factor VIII tolerance can be achieved by the repeated intravenous administration of factor VIII drug. This typically involves infusing the drug multiple times per week for more than a year. By repeatedly presenting the factor VIII drug in the absence of danger signals, the antibody response changes. Tolerance and immunity are not black and white definitions. There is gray area. Factor VIII immune tolerance induction therapy has four major outcomes. Although the definitions vary by organization, here are the basics. Tolerance is achieved when no inhibitory antibodies are detectable and when factor VIII can achieve a high dose in the body and have a long half-life. Partial tolerance does not meet all of these criteria, and failure to achieve tolerance is failure to achieve partial tolerance. Relapse occurs when patients achieving successful tolerance see a return in inhibitory antibodies. Here is some surprising data about how antibody levels or titers change after factor VIII tolerance induction. Interestingly, even some healthy individuals without hemophilia A have detectable factor VIII antibodies, although in low concentration. Even a modest number of hemophilia A patients without inhibitors have detectable factor VIII antibodies, although in low concentration. All patients with hemophilia A with inhibitors have factor VIII antibodies, and all have high titers of these antibodies. However, only a modest number of patients with hemophilia A achieving tolerance have factor VIII antibodies, and the level of antibody is low. In total, this data reveals the importance of antibody titer. Unexpectedly, healthy individuals can make antibodies to factor VIII. In addition, individuals with hemophilia A who achieve tolerance to factor VIII can also make factor VIII antibodies. However, hemophilia A patients who achieve tolerance have a significant reduction in titers of factor VIII antibodies to levels seen in healthy individuals. Here is some interesting data about factor VIII tolerance and how the antibody subclass changes after tolerance induction. Healthy individuals can make low levels of IgG1 antibodies against factor VIII. In addition, hemophilia A patients without inhibitors can make low levels of IgG1 antibodies to factor VIII. All patients with hemophilia A with inhibitors make IgG1 and IgG4 antibodies against factor VIII. However, patients with hemophilia A who achieve tolerance have only modest levels of IgG1 antibodies against factor VIII and no IgG4 antibodies against factor VIII. In total, this reveals that the subclass of antibodies against factor VIII changes with tolerance. For example, while all patients with hemophilia A with inhibitors make IgG4 antibodies to factor VIII, no other group of individuals make this subclass of antibodies. This data clearly demonstrates that antibody production is altered by tolerance induction therapy. By reviewing factor VIII clinical tolerance data, we can now form a complete definition of immune tolerance. Immune tolerance is defined by more than antibody titer, antibody specificity, and antibody class and subclass. Tolerance must include a reduction in harm caused by the antibodies. For hemophilia A patients with inhibitors, the reduction in harm is demonstrated by an increased recovery of factor VIII medication and an increased half-life of factor VIII. At Biconcavity, we hope to improve the lives of patients with antibody-mediated conditions through education and the development of new therapies. Visit Biconcavity.com for more information.